My name is Lou Marcos, and I've been a professor of English at Houston Baptist University since 1991. Over all those years, I have taught the Odyssey to probably 2,000 students, but I can honestly say that I have never gotten tired of teaching the Odyssey. That great epic tells the story of how Odysseus, after fighting for 10 years in the Trojan War, took another 10 long years to find his way back home to his island home of Ithaca, to his wife Penelope and his son Telemachus, who was only a month old when he left for Troy. And yet, as exciting as the epic of Odysseus is, there is a second epic in the Odyssey that's hidden within the greater epic. If you look at books one, two, three, and four on their own, they tell their own mini epic about Odysseus' son, Telemachus. Critics for 2,000 years have been aware of this, and they often refer to books one to four as the Telemachia, or the story of Telemachus. Now, in book one to four of the Odyssey, Telemachus is about 20 years old, the age of most of you who are listening to this right now. And in those four books, we watch Telemachus come of age. The coming of age genre is one of my favorites. It's very popular in American literature, from Tom Sawyer to Huck Finn to Catcher in the Rye, to Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby, or, or Ishmael in Moby Dick, the coming-of-age story takes a young man who is untested, who has never found out what he's made of. And during the story, whether it's a short story, a novel, even an epic, during that period, our young hero goes through a rite of passage, R-I-T-E. And during that rite of passage, he learns who he is and what he is made of. Now imagine if you're Telemachus, you are the son of a father who is a legendary hero who fought in the Trojan War, but you've never met him. You have no memory of him. And you grow up in a house without a father, wondering if you can measure up to this hero that you've heard of all your life. When the Odyssey opens, it does not open with Odysseus. We don't meet him until book five. It opens with Telemachus, and there he is in Ithaca looking disconsolate because for the last three years, a group of young suitors have been trying to force Telemachus' Pen mother, Penelope, to forget her husband and marry one of them not because they love Penelope, but because they want her wealth and they want to be the new king of Ithaca. And while they're waiting for Penelope to make up their mind, her mind, they are eating her out of house and home. Telemachus is horrified by these young men, but he's too weak and unsure of himself to know what to do. That is until Athena, disguised as a human male, comes to Ithaca to try to rouse Telemachus. Now, when she gets there, all of the suitors, even though they are devouring food that is not theirs, refuse to share any of their food with the stranger. Now, in the time of Homer, and even in Greece today, the relationship between a guest and a host was considered sacred. They called it xenia, the guest-host relationship. And you are supposed to show hospitality to a guest. The suitors, even though it's not their food, shrug her off. But Telemachus, the noble young man, feels bad that a stranger is being left at the door and so invites her in and feeds her and begins to speak to her. And the stranger, Athena in disguise, tells him, you need to go on a journey to look for information about your father. And if you find that your father has died, you must come home, you must have a funeral, you must marry your mother off to a suitable suitor, and then you must destroy these evil suitors. And then she says the words that Telemachus was waiting for someone to say, you are no longer a child. You must be a man now. You must be like Odysseus, or even more, you must be like Orestes. For you see, when Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek expedition in Troy, came home, he was killed by his wife's lover. But seven years later, his noble son Orestes came back and killed the evil man who killed his father. Athena tells Telemachus he must be like Orestes. 
Now, Telemachus, rather than brush that off, says, oh, I wish I could be like him, and then future ages would call me a hero. And then Athena turns into a bird and disappears, and Telemachus feels a change inside of him. He strides back into the hall like a god, and he yells at the suitors and tells them to stop their antics. The suitors try to sweet-talk him and get him to go back to eating and drinking with them. But Telemachus has become a man and will no longer be dragged back into their partying and their revelry. Then in books three and four, he goes on a journey to meet the heroes of his father, first Nestor and then later, later Menelaus, the husband of Helen. Now, the supposed reason for his trip is to find information about his father. But you know what? All the information he finds doesn't actually do him any good. That's not the real reason Homer sends Telemachus on this journey. He sends them because this boy has grown up on an island and has known nothing else. He not only needs to become a man, he needs experience of the world. Even more importantly, if Telemachus is going to fight and possibly lay down his life to win back his palace and his family, he needs to understand what he's fighting for. You see, poor Telemachus has never seen a working family. The Greeks called it an oikos, where we get the word economics. The house as an economical unit. Telemachus has never seen that in action. He doesn't know what he's fighting for. And so when he goes to Nestor and Menelaus, he sees what the domestic life should be like. And he goes back with much more courage. Now, when he meets these heroes, you know he's nervous. But he is able to show these older men that he is like his father, both brave and well-spoken. And there are wonderful moments when Odysseus' friends tell Telemachus, you speak just like your father. Now, of course, in one sense, that's nonsensical since he's never met his father. But in the world of Homer, this nobility is, is almost hereditary. It's been carried down from from Odysseus, the man who was both a great warrior and a great speaker, a smooth talker, a gentleman, if you will. And Telemachus learns that he can live up to his father, that he can do what is necessary. Now, when he meets Nestor, he's full of questions, not just about his father. He wants to know everything about Orestes because he wants to live up to this young man, same age as him, who has shown himself to be a hero. And Nestor tells him something he probably didn't want to hear. And that is that finally, after seven years, Orestes rose up, went back to his home, and killed the evil Logistus. Then, that very night, while, while Orestes is having a feast, then his uncle Menelaus, his father's brother, shows up. Now, you know what this says if you're Telemachus? It means, you know what? Dad may come home, but I may still have to do this deed myself. He needs to be a man. He needs to grow up and learn what it means to defend his world. After meeting the heroes, he is rejuvenated, not really rejuvenated, but filled with energy, filled with hope, filled with purpose. And he goes back, and when his father returns, he will work together with him to destroy the suitors and win back Ithaca. I do hope that you will enjoy reading the Odyssey and identifying yourself with Telemachus, who, like yourself now, is trying to prove that he is every much the scholar and soldier as his heroic father. Enjoy.